everyone. Um, ooh, good start to the video. Uh, I finished my match about two and a half hours ago with Ginger GM, and I didn't take a nap. So if I fall asleep, we're going to get one of our customers to complete the lecture. I didn't know who I was going to lecture on. Um, I was thinking about doing me, because I was a great player in the past, but after today's match, I guess I'm not. So uh, we're going to do Svetisvar Gligorich for several reasons. And 99% is you suggested it, gentlemen in the audience, who comes to most of my lectures. But the other reason is, and that's like the 0.1% of the reason, a friend of mine um, named Giannis, who's some can't believe I, ever, I even know who his dad is, um, several years ago he found out that Svetozar Gligorich exists. And he was like, what? Svetozar? That's the greatest name ever. So he was very pleased that that person existed. Gligorich was uh, sort of like our last lecture with David Bronstein. He was a good player for about 50 years. Okay, I was a good player for about 50 seconds, and then my flag fell. Um, Gligorich was born in 1923 in countries that may or may not exist anymore, and he died in 2012, pretty recently, at the age of 89. And he played chess till the end. In fact, in 1988, which I guess wasn't anywhere near the end, I played him. And let's see, how old was he in 88? So he was 14, and then 89, 75? 88. 88, um, 60, 65. 65. What did I say? 75? Yeah. Ooh, I was so close. Oh, actually, 80 was a lot further away from 2012 than I expected. I guess I'm still tired from my match. Anyway, I was an FM, he was an aging GM, so we agreed to a quick draw. We knew what we were doing. Um, so I was lucky that I got him in 88 and not in, like, you know, 84. Then, then things would have been different. Um, he was the Yugoslav champion more times than anybody can remember. He beat almost all the world champions, um, unless he didn't play them, then he didn't beat them. And he was probably top 10 or 15 in the world for at least 30 years. I mean, he was a really strong player. He won many, 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 many tournaments. And I was actually reading about him before he died because he started doing something else like playing music. Let's see, does he even say what he was? Oh yeah, he was a famous journalist in chess and writ many, wrote, writ, wrote many books. And mainly they talk about his chess achievements like playing for Yugoslavia in 15 chess Olympiads, 13 on first board, and winning all these tournaments. And they have his lifetime record against world champions. Um, he won games against Irva, Botvinnik, Smyslov, Petrosian, Tal, Spassky. It never beat Spassky, it says. No wins. Fisher he beat four times. Never beat Karpov and never beat Kasparov. But um, he had a really good record against somebody. Let's see. I guess it was beat Petrosian eight times. Wow. That's a lot of times to beat Petrosian. Um, and he beat Spislav six times. Those were guys who didn't lose very often. So he played against about 10 world champions, and he beat almost all of them. He never became world champion himself. And, um, yeah, in the openings, he's very famous for Rui Lopez and Kings India, which we're going to see examples of. And you can read a lot about him on the Internet, but Gligorich was a fantastic player. I'm glad I met him the one time I did. That was in the World Chess Festival in St. John, New Brunswick in 1988. New York Times has an obituary about a chess player who wasn't the world champion. So you know, you know the guy was good because you're not seeing a lot of chess player obits in the New York Times unless, you know, somebody that you have to have an obit about, like Bobby Fischer. And then, okay, then you have to do it. And they even have a game of his. In fact, that looks very familiar, that position. So I think we're going to look at that game. Um, and they talk about his whole life and non-chess stuff as well. Okay, let's look at the chess games. The first game is the funniest to me, and you'll, you'll see why when I show you. Um, we'll flip the board. This was against an unknown player, um, Antonio Angel Medina Garcia, and, so, and it was played uh, at Palma de Mallorca, which is funny because they said on the internet, which means it has to be true, that the player himself was a Spanish player, the player with white, which makes sense, and, and Gligorich beat him with the Spanish. Now, you're going to notice something very unusual about this game, and I don't have to tell you, you're going to notice. And we'll see who points it out first. Try to point it out before the game ends. Try. Okay, so it was a Rui Lopez, and Gligorich was famous for playing black. Well, we call it the Rui Lopez here in the U.S. In Europe, they call it the Spanish. And this is the closed Spanish. This is very common. Basically, before everybody started playing the Berlin, this is when everybody played with black, and Karpov would beat them every game. Okay, and white plays h3, and this position is very common at the grandmaster level even today. 
But I would say, if you asked me, on move 9, this is move 9, what position in chess is the most common at the super grandmaster level, I would pick this one. It's a Rui Lopez, which is a very common opening. And when you saw Rui Lopez at the super GM level, this was the most common position. And now, black has many moves. Black can play bishop b7, bishop e6, knight a5, h6, and, or g, you know, he could do that if he's intoxicated, h6, and rook e8. They're all book moves. I didn't even mention probably the most common one, because I'm tired, which is knight b8, surprising the audience. That's called the Briar Variation, named after Greg Shahadi's favorite ice cream. Okay, and then the knight goes back to d7, and the bishop fianchettos, also very common. Now, uh, I'll explain the variation in question to you, since this is a lecture. Uh, many, many, many years ago, Smyslov invented a system for black, which Gligorich employs in this position, which players today don't play, because you can avoid playing the move h6, and they do. Now, occasionally, grandmasters don't actually play a real game. They play, but they already knew before the game they were going to draw. Very suspicious behavior. And this is a very common way to do it. So you'll see a lot of grandmaster games that are quickly drawn, if those are the games that are happening, that go like this. Rook e8, knight g5, rook f8, knight f3, and then there's a three-move repetition. And if you go to a database, you'll see that a lot. Okay? And it doesn't even mean that they agreed to a draw before the game, it just means that's what they did. Now, the point of rook e8 is to play my favorite move, always play. No, nobody, nobody there watch, they're, they're, they're silent. Al always play bishop f8. Oh, that's right. Right. Okay, now, if white makes a random legal move, let's say d4, and then we play bishop f8, if you play knight g5 to hit me on f7, now I can play the move rook e7, and I've saved myself. And if you don't have to play h6, why am I playing h6? So Grandmaster started playing rook e8. This was named after Zayatsev, one of your favorite Grandmasters. Zayatsev was not known for playing chess. What was he known for? Got my usual audience here who's well versed on the chess stuff. Exactly. <laughs> And the answer is, he was known for being Karpov's coach. So Zayatsev was Karpov's trainer for forever. Okay, even now. Well, not now. Okay, and that's called the Zayatsev variation. Okay, but this was in 1968, so the Zayatsev variation wasn't known, because it didn't exist yet. So black played h6, and now knight g5 is risky. Only Ginger GM would play that, giving his knight away. No. Okay, so d4, and now I'm going to show you the difference. Okay, notice that black played the same moves I just told you. And if black had played rook e8 and bishop f8 earlier, it's impossible for white to play this maneuver because this pawn would be not defended well. I could play bishop b7 and then I could take your pawn because my rook is on your pawn, my knight is on your pawn. But here I don't want to take your pawn, so you can do this because bishop d5 is skewering everything, or forking or something, okay? So this threat of taking this and taking this doesn't really exist. And if I don't play the move h6, I can play a move that actually does something. So the Zayatsev variation was very common because you would have a bishop on b7 here, and black and white can't play knight f1 because e4 is hanging. So then they had to play some other ways. If you follow chess history, you know that Karpov and Kasparov played about a million games together in the 80s and 90s, and they had a lot of Zayatsev Rui Lopez, because Karpov's trainer was Zayatsev. Okay, well, this is 1968. Now, other than Smyslov, it's named after Smyslov, so, um, Gligorich was the main practitioner of the Smyslov variation, which is this one. Okay, and he played knight f1, because now, if you decide to take my pawn, bishop d5 is going to I'm going to attack all your pieces. Okay, so we have time to play knight f1, knight g3. And that's why the Zayatsev variation was invented, so white can't do that. Bishop b7, knight g3, and black's playing a Zayatsev with the move h6, which gives white time to do this. Okay, now this is 1968. I wasn't born yet, so I'm innocent. 
Okay, this game was so good, I was born the next year. Some people were really excited watching it. Okay, so black played knight a5, attacking the bishop. You guys are Rue Lopez experts, right? So what did white play? Always plays the same move in this position. Why did black play knight a5? What was his reasoning? Target the bishop. Yeah, he wants to take the bishop on b3. This is called the Spanish bishop. So does white want to let black take that bishop? No. Right. And, coincidentally, we're unleashing on e4. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now if it was black to play, you could go here and probably win a pawn. So bishop c2 stops all of that. Okay. And you're like, well, if the guy plays bishop c2, why is your knight on a5? Boo! Okay, so knight c4, he showed us. Now, in the Briar variation, which I showed before you showed up, do you have a rating, by the way? Uh, not exactly. All right, close enough. Okay, in, in the Briar variation, black plays knight b8, knight d7, and you guys were, they were confused, like, why would you do that? Well, then the bishop has this nice open diagonal. It's not blocked by this knight. Well, it's not clear where the black knight is going, but I know this bishop just got a lot better. And the knight can very safely go to b6, if necessary, and then I can start punching open the center. Rawr, which we're going to see in later games, but not this game. Okay, bishop d3, knight b6. And now, if you just walked in the room, and I told you this bishop moved 100 million times, you wouldn't believe me. You would say, well, white played bishop d3 and then castled. When in fact, white played bishop b5, bishop a4, bishop b3, bishop c2, bishop d3. That's modern chess. And it was almost 50 years ago. Still modern. Okay, so it's sort of a blocked position, very boring. Naturally, even though you might think, well, Gligorich was a famous player, and this other guy we never heard of, why isn't Gligorich doing this? Why isn't he going rawr and crushing him? Because that's not how you beat somebody. One way to beat somebody is to make the game go a long time, and after 50, 60, 70 moves, if the player's not a grandmaster, it's likely they're going to make a lot of mistakes. If you trade all the pieces off, there's less pieces to blunder, as I pointed out in my match with, with Ginger GM. The more pieces I traded off, the less I could blunder. So by playing slow, positional, boring chess, Gligorich can outplay his opponent eventually. That's the plan. Okay, bishop d2, that's not a move I would consider. And if you ask me to explain that move, I'm not good enough. I, and a lot of people, when, when I have students and they make moves like that, and I'm like, so why did you go there? They always give me the same answer. I, I develop my bishop. And I'm like, ah, I get frustrated. Obviously, when you move your pieces, you're trying to improve what square they're on. And I don't see why d2 is better than c1. I do see my rook can go to c1, which I'm not going to do. So I've never seen a Rui Lopez where the, the pawn structure was like this, and white played bishop d2. That's a strange, very strange move. Okay, c5. Now, the knight was on c6, and then he moved his knight all around everywhere. Now his pawn on c7 isn't blocked. And in the prior variation, where black is usually doing this, which I've talked about a lot, if white ever plays d5, black can play c6 and attack the pawn. So the knight actually on c6 isn't very good, because it blocks the c-pawn and it blocks the bishop. So very interesting maneuvering. Now, if somehow the pawns get traded, either you take this way, or you take this way, which gives you the same position. Now your bishop all of a sudden isn't defended because of your brilliant bishop to d2 move. Brilliant. Uh, not really. Okay, d5. I understand that move. Bishop c8. This is the kind of move that a grandmaster plays all the time, confusing the... Because white played bishop d2 and black undeveloped his bishop. But you put your pieces on good squares. The bishop on b7 was a great square. I can't, I can't find a better square. Now, now it's not so good. Right. Now, this diagonal is much more important because it's an open diagonal. There's nothing here. This diagonal is closed. So I put my bishop on the open diagonal. Now my bishop might do something eventually. b3, stopping the black knight. I always try to play b3 when my opponent's knight is on b6. And then I leave my pawn on b3, and they leave their knight on b6. And then knight can't do anything. C4, which is explosive. Explosive. C4. 
you'll hear all my jokes 50 times and you'll leave. Yeah. I've heard them online. There you go. Okay. So Bishop F1 because, because, you don't need to look at the position. What's that here? What's that? Always play bishop f1. Even the people in the room don't do have the right answer. So these players are very good. They play c4, they play bishop f1, they play bishop f8, and you just keep laughing at me at home. Well, those rules are stupid, and then it's every move they play. Games I never saw in my life. They follow my rules. Ow. Okay. Bishop to d7. Bishop's better on d7, because we can connect our rooks. Our bishop is controlling these squares. The rook can go to c8. Okay. Knight h2. The guy's trying to maneuver his knight. Now there's two ideas with knight h2. I don't think white did either one of them. So that didn't work out. Sometimes you want to play knight g4. Although I don't know why you would want to do that here. And sometimes you want to play f4. Well, if your knight's on f3, you, you can't play f4. Well, I don't think you want to play f4 because black's rook is on e8 and I would take it. I don't really like knight h2. This position's too hard to play. Like, when it's all open, you sort of know what to do. Here you got to make your own plan. Okay? And there's two ways to play white here. White could say, well, my opponent's a famous player, top ten in the world, and the position's about equal. I'm just going to chill. And then if it's a draw, he'll be very mad, so he'll go crazy. Or my opponent will outplay me and I'll lose. Or you could say, I have more space in the center. I have to do something. So I'm going to play knight h2. I'm going to play f4, I'm going, to, I'm going to do something. And knight h2 is actually quite a common move with the Ruy Lopez, because often white's trying to make moves like this and try to play on the king side. Okay, rook c8, b4, he decided we're going to close up the queen side. Now you weren't here when I asked them this. I think they can answer now. This is, you, you might be able to answer. If you don't, we're going to keep going. My question was, What's unusual about this game? You, you might even notice now. No pawns have been exchanged. No, nothing has been exchanged. Right. Oh, yeah. right. What move is it? It's crowded. <laughs> yeah. 21. Yeah. Is that what happens in your games? No. No. Right. When something gets traded, let me know. Okay. Knight a4. Knight just sits on a4. Maybe it's going to take this pawn if he moves his bishop. Maybe I'll go to d3. Okay. Queen f3, as I indicated. g6, stopping the knife f5. Always a good thing to stop. Bishop e2. Now, bishop e2 is a very bad move, but you're probably like, well, this game's really boring. How do you know if that move is good or not? Nothing's happening. Well, in chess, you want to have active pieces. This piece is in white's position, controlling these squares in white's position. So the knight could go to b2. The bishop can't leave the pawn. The queen... Conversely, bishop e2 traps the queen. This queen has very few squares to go to. When I have my queen out, I like to have lots of ways to move it away in case it gets attacked. I don't like when my queen's out like that. So, and also bishop e2, the only reason I can find for it is to remaneuver my knight, but I don't, why is my knight here? I don't know. So white just didn't know what to do, so he just did nothing. And he thought, okay, I'll draw, I'll do nothing. Bishop g7 h4, ginger GM would approve. Black has a very simple plan, in my opinion. The center's blocked, and the queen side's blocked. That's unusual. What part's not blocked? King side. King side. What do we usually do with black in these positions? We want to open the king side. What move is the general idea? What am I eventually going to do? What's the long-term plan? F5. F5. I'm going to play F5. And if I play like rook f8 and move my knight somewhere and play f5, I don't, I don't like that queen there. That's not good. Okay, so he played h4. Whew, I can't recommend that. And I assume the idea is if I play h5 and you play g5, white has a stranglehold on f5 now. Okay. So he played knight h7. He's going to play f5. Wait, was anything traded yet? No. Okay. h5, knight g5. And now, white has a tough decision to make, because if he trades for this knight, now this pawn is weaker, he got rid of his bishop, black has the two bishops, eventually, black will try to get his bishop to this diagonal. It might take a while, but it's worth it. And eventually I might play f5, and I have the two bishops. So he moved his queen. 
very dangerous because the queen doesn't have a lot of squares to retreat to. I would say zero. When you move your queen out and you lose your queen, don't come crying to me unless you're paying me for lessons and you can cry all you want. You can cry every hour. Get paid by the hour. Okay, F5. Now, the question is, is white losing? I'm threatening F4. If I turn the engine on, I think it's going to say white's losing. But nobody took anything. It's moved 26. But somehow white got his queen in front of his pieces, and he can't retreat his queen, and black has a big threat. Black's threatening F4. So I think white's losing here. Okay, I'll turn the engine on, and it's going to say equal, because I'm tired today, so I'm, I'm innocent. Wow, it says black is incredibly winning. Wow. And no, nobody traded anything. So that's how a stronger player beats a weaker player, better maneuvering skills. And you may have noticed, occasionally I beat somebody good. It's very occasional. And I always beat them in the same opening. I play the opening where nobody can do anything. The reason is, I have a lot of experience in that opening, and they don't. So I play this block Benoni, where nobody can move in the center, just like this. I move my knights around, they fall asleep, and I win. And I beat Mama Jarov doing that, I beat Gazzoli, who you never heard of, and I beat Conrad Holt. Conrad Holt's not as good as Gazzoli, but you heard of him. Conrad Holt? Yeah. Oh, okay. And you haven't heard of Gazzoli? No. Yeah, see, I know my audience. Gazzoli's a French grandmaster, he's number... Four in France, number five. He's one of them, four or five. He's better than Holt. And I'm, in the Pro Chess League, I'm, I'm naming games that I won against strong players. That was all in the Pro Chess League within a three-month period. Okay, so when I'm black in these block positions, I have a reasonable idea of what to do. I play them a lot, and my opponents are like, what's this opening? This block Benoni is really weird. Well, this is the same thing, except... Gligorich's opening is recommended by other grandmasters. He's playing Black and Rui Lopez, and he's playing better than his opponent. Did Gligorich make a lot of queen moves? Hmm. When the position's blocked, why am I moving my queen in front of my pieces? So I can lose it? The answer is yes. Okay, so after F5, I'm going to play F4. Now, on the internet, where they're never wrong, this is, this is wrong even for the internet. That's saying something. There was a guy on like chessgames.com comment section, and he said, now this next move is terrible. White should have played F3. That loses less material. And I'm like, F3 and black plays F4? And he was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's okay. Okay, so the suggestion for improvements for white probably should have come earlier than here, not like giving pieces away. Also, I turned the engine on and it says white should resign. Okay, he played... You guys are sitting down because this is going to scare some of you. Queen a7. Well, f4 is winning and the queen's trip, so that's the only square you can go to. Okay. Then f4. Now, I wanted you guys to remind me when something gets traded. Okay, move 27. Okay, knight f1. Rook a8. What, what did white do? Where can he go? Take the rook. Yeah. Take the rook. Wow. Oh, Take the rook is okay, but I mean, oh, the, the pawn. The pawn. He can't. Wait, what pawn are you talking about? This one the rook's protecting. Oh yeah. Yeah. B seven. B seven. That you don't lose your queen. And then they repeated and agreed to a draw. No, he played rook e seven. Now bishop e eight is unstoppable. Obviously, bishop c eight, which looks good, hangs the rook. So bishop e8 does not hang the rook. And bishop e8 controls c6, so your queen can't get out. And so white resigned. resigned. So 29 moves, nothing got traded, white resigned. Yeah. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's why one guy's sort of famous, and the other guy, who's that guy? Right. And bishop e2 is a bad move. h4, h5 was bad, and his queen got trapped. And... Weaker players love moving their queen out and taking everything. In fact, stronger players also like taking everything. But if you move your queen out, sometimes you lose your queen. And even though the queen was on e3 and it wasn't lost yet, because of the f5, f4 idea, which was the obvious idea, that's black was going to play f5 all day. And white had nothing to do against that. So that was a funny game because white got crushed so badly, but nothing ever got captured. I, I've never beaten anybody 
anything like that, where nothing was ever captured ever, it has moved 29. And the engine, in the position where I thought White was doing really badly, was doing worse than I thought. Like his pieces were just blocking his queen, and he had no active play. Couldn't White have played F4 on that position? Uh, and we have to go way back, I assume, since I'm on a right, four. When the, yeah. when the queen we have to go way back. Yeah, there. right there. So in this yeah. position, yeah. right there. Whew, with your queen on e3. I'll save it for I know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, yeah, the problem with f4, off the top of my head, and I'll turn the engine on and I'll really refute it, is this is insufficiently protected, mm -hmm. so when we trade, I can just take this now, because I got two guys on it. And then you get a lot of things attacked. I'm also thinking bishop e5 is a good move. I'm also thinking knight takes e4 is a good move. That just wins the center pawn. And I actually like all those moves. So I don't know what's the best because they're all good. So I'd probably blunder and lose. Okay, e4 is the best. I like bishop e5. I wasn't sure what to do against queen f2. It says every move is plus 5. Wow. Yeah. Actually, after f4, it doesn't move the knight away. Oh, because I play knight takes e4. I thought I could go here, but the truth hurts. Yeah, e4. Then, yeah, man. Then your c3 and your queen. Ah, oh, plus yeah. eight down a pawn. Yeah, so that's one guy outplaying the other guy. And you might say, well, Gligorich was good and that guy wasn't, which is a true statement. However, Gligorich was especially good in the black side of Rui Lopez and black in the King's Indian. That's what he's known for. He played many times. And he wasn't born doing that, but if you enjoy some openings, and you happen to be a grandmaster, and you decide, okay, I'm going to play this opening a lot, well, in 1968, you just won. Nowadays, if I'm like, oh, I'm playing Grandmaster A, it's a funny name, and he always plays this opening, now I can look at every game he ever played, and I move 19, I can play a movie he doesn't know, and my computer told me about it when I was asleep. Okay, so now it's tougher to do that. But back in 68, Gligerich could play a hundred times Black and the Rui Lopez and get these positions and get a lot of experience. And his opponent, who's playing e4, has to know other Rui Lopez's, the French defense, the Karokans, the Peerts, the Scandinavian, the Alkine, the Sicilian. So if this is just one opening that he faces, Gligerich is always playing this, so he gets a lot of experience. Okay, now that guy was Rufus and or Doofus. Now we're going to get to some serious guys. Serious, and they're both world champions. It's good to beat the world champion, okay? One of them is Mikhail Tall. Now, the reason I like this game is, first of all, it was in a candidates match. So, it's good to beat Tall in a candidates match. Second, Tall played like Tall. The way, you, whatever you expect Tall to do, that's exactly what he does. And Gligerich beats him anyway. So, this isn't going to go on Tall's game collections because, you know, he played like he didn't, he didn't win. So, in fact, he lost. So, the same opening. Tall likes to play e4 with white. Okay, this is the exact same. This is the exact same, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm showing you the same game. Let's see if you guys remember what happened last game. We had a long talk about it. What did Gligerich do here in the last game? Not a5. Not yet. No, you rook. Uh, uh, h6. Oh, h6. And what, and which world champion is that named after? The same world champion might be right. What's that? Smith's Yeah, that's the Smith's Law variation. Okay. And this is still the same. It says that up there. Right. Also, this is the Bob Seeger approved of this game because it's still the same. Yeah. This is still the same. This is the same game. I think Tall did a little better than that guy. Now, this game was interesting. This is still the same. Okay. And what did Gligerich do? He played knight a5, right? And then the guy played bishop c2, and Gligerich played knight c4. Okay, now what did the guy do here? Now, I'm getting old. I think he played bishop d3. The, the game we just looked at, I think the guy played here. Yeah. Okay. And Tall played a4. Following my rule, I can hear him screaming at home. When your opponent's pawn is on b5, you play a4. In fact, that would have been nice in the last game when Black went his knight on a4 and White couldn't move anything ever. So he went over to the king's side where he got crushed. Okay, a4 is a normal... Now, if Gligerich tries to play the same way, then after a5, his knight might get trapped. Knight c4, b3. So he'll have to like start retreating. Okay. Also, we can open up the a file, and then white can play on all sides of the board. So a4 makes sense. First to move of the, of the lecture. Yeah, same as the first game. Okay, d5. Wow. 
So Gligorich decided he's going to play aggressively against Hall. Okay, Gligorich was a good play. This is a candidates match. They're not kidding around here. Okay, this is game one too. This is the first game. So when you're playing somebody who's a wild and crazy attacking player and you attack them, that's probably not their forte. Probably not. Now d5 helps black a lot. It makes all these things better. The bishop on f8 also. But it makes this bishop on c2 better because when e1 goes away, white's got this nice open diagonal. So d5 is a very dangerous move for everybody. b3 kicking the knight away. And he takes on e4. And we get a tactical melee. Knight e4, knight e4, bishop e4, bishop e4, rook e4. The knight's still attacked on c4. Queen d5 attacking the rook. Rook g4 because he's tall. What, what do you want him to do? He's tall. He's going he's gonna to checkmate you. Knight a5 threatening the b3 pawn. Okay. Bishop h6. Now you guys are all scared. You're like, Bishop h6, I'm playing tall. Look, Glyndrich followed my rule before I was born, which is always play. He already did it. He did it a long time ago. We talked about it already. Bishop f8. Bishop always play bishop f8. Right. Now, you, now you know why. Because Tall's going to play bishop h6. Now you're like, yeah, whatever. My bishop's on f8. Okay, knight b3 material still equal. Rook, the rook's attacked. Takes on a4. Doubled isolated rook pawns. As a friend of mine in Michigan once said, those are derps. Doubled isolated rook pawns. Yep, that's the acronym. Okay, now in this position, after rook a3, he could have taken the rook, ooh, and then given away g7. That would have been very interesting. Okay, takes, takes, I assume king h8, knight g5, queen h5, knight f7. There's, that's tall for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's tall. And he's like, my bishop's on f8. Now let's see what the engine does. Does the engine take the rook and defend no. perfectly? No. Man, even the engine doesn't take that rook. Mm -mm. But when the engine doesn't take the rook, you better not take that rook. So he, let's, see what, let's see what the engine says about this. That says white's winning. Yep. Oh, this is a funny variation. After king f8, you can discover check and then win the queen. Yeah. Okay, and if you play king h8, as I indicated, knight g5, and the computer says incredibly winning for white. So that would be Tall versus somebody else. They take the rook, Tall mates them, and they're like, Tall is the greatest. This ain't a lecture on Tall. It's a lecture on Gligorich, so Gligorich didn't take the rook. We can see Tall was pretty good. Probably rook a3 was an unexpected move. Okay, so he takes on a4, leaving his bishop on f8. Rook takes a4. Rook b8, again, activating his rook. Rook takes a6, now black's down a pawn. Now it's equal material. C5 attacking the center. Black's down a pawn, he's going to win it back. Bishop e3, rook b4. Wow, he's really attacking that pawn. Queen b7 attacking the rook. Rook goes to h6 like you guys would do. This looks like I'm showing you a tall game. This looks like tall's going to crush Gligorich. What a potzer. But bishop f8. Bishop's on f8. She takes on d4 and he's like, what do you want? Rook b1 winning the queen. Solid. So that was very nice. Knight takes d4 with this discovered attack. Now when I said winning the queen, obviously I was tricking you because I'm tricky. Bishop c1. Always retreat. Queen b2. So if Tall had won this game, this would be the greatest game ever. But Gligorich won it, so it's the greatest game ever for him. So the problem is if we trade queens... These rooks aren't so good for the end game. They're sort of hanging, and they're not defending against this pass pawn. So do you think Tall traded queens? No. No. What's the most aggressive move you've ever seen in your life? That's what he played. He's Tall. Bam! Now admit it. If you were black, you'd be scared. In fact, you're not black, and you are scared. You're like, man, I'm scared. This looks like me. There's a reason why it looks like me. So white's up a piece, and white's threatening mate in one, and he's got all his pieces here. Man, Tall was pretty good. Even when he lost, it was great. Okay, so queen c1 check, obviously. King h2. 
Bishop d6 check. So the problem is, if you take with a rook, you're not threatening mate anymore. If you play g3, then I mate you. And if you play queen check in this position, I just move my king up and my king's safe. So this forces him to play rook takes bishop. That gets rid of white's only threat. Also, that bishop's defended. You forgot the pawns move backwards, confusing the audience. Pawns don't really move backwards, but it's still defended. No. Yeah. So he has to take it, you agree. And how's it defended? How did black take that rook? He, he took the rook. F4. What's that? Queen yeah, yeah he played queen f4 and took the rook. Yeah. Rook g3, takes. Man, even when it's all still... Oh yeah. Man, you're still, you still want to have white. You're like, wait a minute. Black did everything he wanted and white's still mating him. Man, the chess is hard. All right, so what do you play with black? Man, I know the game, I don't know the answer. G6. Then I play knight takes queen. No, you rook on e to on e to e1, right? So if you play rook e1, no, no, I can't no, mate no, you no, with no. rook g7 because no, no. I'm pinned. Yeah, if I play rook here, threatening yeah, yeah. mate, you can't mate me because you're, you're mating me as illegal. Yeah. I've seen this game, I still don't know what he did. Man, I like your move. Let's see what happened. There you go. All right. And now Tall resigned? Nope. Queen takes f7 check. He's tall. This looks like white should resign because that's mate. And he can't stop it. But instead, Tall found this move and then went into an ending down in exchange for a pawn. Really exciting game. Yeah. Okay, unfortunately... Ooh, that's, now that's a pawn. When I said c4 was explosive, I wasn't kidding. Yeah, so he defended his pawn there, and he's going to push this pawn, and he's got his rook behind his pawn. And now the shocking move. There's only one move here that's shocking. That's what he played. Only one move would shock you. Resigned? <laughs> well, black won the game, so that would be shocking. It is a Gligerich Glitter, a lecture, after all. Rook takes knight. Rook takes knight, yeah. Oh, yeah it doesn't matter how many pawns you have, it's which ones are promoting to a queen. Yeah. And then he played rook c7, as we tell our students. And now I know his next four moves. Yeah. I know what they are. And that, that's king's not quick enough. That's too slow. Okay, I, can, I can prove it. Ah, so close. Close, right? Okay. Well, if you're not going to put your king over there, you've got to put your rook over there. How do you do that? Not easy. Put your rook on c2 when I push my pawn. Then when I go here threatening this pawn, I can get a tempo on your rook too. And then these pawns are not dangerous. So that's what happened. He got his rook back there. And then he's like, all right. Now this pawn's going to cost you a rook, and you'll be down a rook. And then the engine says, black is super winning. But good numbers, right? Really, really good number. You didn't think they'd be that easy. The guy, wow. You see the guy in the audience. He's like, I don't even know what's happening. I think if I had a better computer, like one of those super, and I left it on for an hour, it would just say mate. Yeah, in fact, this one might say mate. I don't think it will. I think this one can't see the mate. Mate's probably in like 26 moves. I don't think it can see that far. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it sees that it's going to queen and win your rook, and you're not. It does see that. It's like, because if it thought you might queen, it would, it would just say like plus four, or three, but it knows you're not going to promote your pawn to a queen. And of course, tall. Resigned. 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 Yeah. So that was really exciting. Gligorich, no pieces traded. That game, all pieces traded, both sides getting mated, and Gligorich won, also in 68. Okay. Now you're like, okay, tall sacked all his pieces and lost an end game. Of course. Now, which player, also a world champion, you never checkmated him, he was too good a defender? Who would that be? Who was a great defensive world champion, never lost Karpov. a game? Karpov is a good answer. This guy's even more famous for defending. Lost even less often. You're like, never heard of him. Well, Capablanca. Well, he didn't play him. 
Petrosian. Well, Tigran well, Petrosian. Yeah. yeah. All right, and also Gligorich is black again. Usually when I do these lectures, the guy's white and he's pounding the guys. Gligorich is black and he's pounding the guys. That's pretty good. So Gligorich beating Petrosian with black, that's pretty impressive. Okay, and Gligorich wasn't too young during this game. He was born in 23, that said. So 1970s, like how old I am now. Wow, how, how do you beat anybody? I can't beat anybody. Okay. So they played a Kings Indian because I told you guys, Kings Indian and Rui Lopez, we did two Rui Lopez's. Now we'll do a Kings Indian. And Petrosian did really well with White and the Kings Indian because White has more space. The computer loves White. They didn't have computers then, they still love White. That's how good White's position is. Now, this is a position I showed a lot of my students, especially my private students. And then I make fun of them. Okay, I never make fun of my private students, except in this position, or if we're both awake. Then I make fun of them also. And the reason I show this position a lot is this position is very common. If I click reference, which I'm not going to do now because that would give you the answer, there would be thousands of games in this position. Of all Kings Indians, this is the most common position. This is called the classical variation. And in fact, I gave a lecture in this room a few days ago. And I said, what's the most common move for black? And nobody got it right. They suggested every move but the most common move, which is e5. They were like knight c6, knight d7, c6, a6, a5, c5, bishop g4. Those moves are all play, but e5 is the most common. Okay, then knight c6 is the most common. Again, black can play every move. And knight e7 is the only move anybody ever plays. And I've had white and black at this position, not at the same time, and in fact, in the Chicago Open about 10 years ago, in the seven round tournament, now it's nine rounds, it was seven then, um, I had the Kings Indian six times, three times with white, three times with black. And this position occurred like four times. And here, the question I haven't asked yet, I did a long preamble, is what are the most common moves here for white? And now my students fail. Give me any move here you think is common for white. And basically at the super GM level, there's three answers. Super GMs only play three moves here. Can you name one of them? Bishop G5. Bishop G5 is actually the fourth most common move. I used to say one of the four most common moves. And Bishop G5 is the fourth most common. But in the last 10 years, nobody plays Bishop G5. Now, in the 80s, in the early 90s, yeah, Bishop G5 was played occasionally. You know, before you were born. Anybody? Anyone? See how the center sort of blocked? What's that? I was going to say Bishop G5. Yeah. Well, I've played Bishop G5. I've played all four of the common moves. But Bishop G5 is the least common. Pawn B3? You're so close. You couldn't be closer. B4? B4. Yeah, B4. In fact, I was one of the players who popularized B4. In the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, there were two players of note who played B4. I was one of them. And the other was Luke Von Whaley. And Luke Von Whaley was taller than me, and he was a GM, so he got all the credit. Von Whaley and I were doing pretty well with B4, so then Kramnik started playing it, and then nobody heard of us. And like, oh, Kramnik, okay, now we play B4. B4 is called the bayonet variation. It was very common in the 60s and 70s. Okay? And when they played the bayonet variation, they played it a different way than we do now. The most common moves, confusing the audience, are knight e1 and knight d2. The idea is, when black plays f5, like Gligerich did the other games, white can play f3 defending his center. And with the knight on e1, we can go to d3 and advance here. And with the knight on, on e1, we defend the king's side. So, I'm sorry. With the knight on e1, we can go to d3 and attack. And with the knight on d2, when we play b4 and c4, our knight can go to c4, and attack on the queen side. And we always can play f3 defending our pawn, and we can play bishop e3. If we play bishop e3 now, which is considered a very bad move, we play knight g4, and then we play f5. So if you play knight e1 or knight d2, well, if you play knight e1, you can play bishop e3, and you can't play knight g4 because the queen and bishop are lined up. Okay, and now g4 is protected. And when we play bishop e3, we play f3 defending our pawn. If they ever play f4, we have f2 for our bishop. Very common lines. 
So it's unclear which is more common, 91 or 92, uh, after the move 97. Okay, B4 is a move that I know because I play B4 a lot. Now, the two most common moves for black, knight h5 to play f5, and a5 to try to slow white down. And Gligorich played knight h5, the more competitive move. Now, Petrosian played a move I don't know at all. Like, and I, I've played this position a million times in both colors. I still don't know this move. Okay, so bad move. Now, you can play c5, or you can play g3. Those are the common moves. And then, Kramnik started playing Rook E1 and Bishop F1. Always play Bishop F1. Okay? And the old, 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 old main line was C5, Knight F4, takes, takes, threatening the Knight, and then Rook C1. Okay? And then people started playing G3 and said, instead of C5, and said, well, you, you can't play Knight F4 anymore. I've played both moves. I play G3 now. Okay, so he played knight d2. I don't, I don't know this move. This is a very strange move because, here's why it's strange. You could have played knight d2 here, which is a very, which is a very common move. And now, there, there, is no, there is no knight h5. The white would just take it. Then you could play b4 later. In fact, the most common move here is c5, which tries to stop b4. So... I've never seen b4 and then knight d2. Nah. And I guess because of games like this, people really stopped playing it. They stopped playing it before I was born. So, okay. So knight f4, a4, another strange move, f5. I mean, black's getting all of his attack now. Bishop f3. I've never seen knight d2, bishop f3 in a king's Indian. Probably because of this game. They're like, if Petrosian can lose with white, let's not play this way. And again, I wasn't playing chess yet, so that's why I don't know this line. Okay, g5, obviously. We want to play g4. Okay. And I actually have a rule for my students. When you're playing chess and you're both doing stuff on opposite sides of the board, the rule of thumb is whichever side you're looking at, that's the side who's doing better. And none of you are looking at the queen side. You're like, oh, g5, g4, knight f4, and you're like, I'm scared if I'm white. If I'm black, I'm, I'm not scared of that. Okay. So this is better for black. Black has the attacking chances. White isn't doing anything yet. e takes f5, following my rule, always play e takes f5. He waited a little while. Okay. Knight takes f5, and he played g3. So... When you take on f5, the good thing for white is he gets e4. He gets to put his knights there and his bishop there. And the bad thing is, you know, black gets open f file, his knights are nice, his bishop is open. Okay, g3, moving pawns in front of his king, poor t grand Petrosian, always defending poorly. <laughs> they actually got that one, that was good. Okay, knight d4, sacking a piece. That's how you beat Petrosian, you sack a piece. You got to take it, he sacked a piece. This is actually one of my games with Simon Williams. He sacked a piece, taking it was crazy, and then he kept leaving it there, so then I took it. And then he didn't have any compensation. He figured if I didn't take it the first couple times, I'm going to take it later. Well, here, Black's got a lot of compensation. He takes the bishop, plays g4, and he's crashing through on the king side. Queen h1 is a really funny move. The engine doesn't like that. The engine plays queen d3. It's queen h1. That's crazy. Okay, now this is what we call long-term compensation. Black isn't winning immediately, but I can tell you many good things about black's position. Number one, I have the two bishops. You don't. Number two, that's looking pretty good. Number three, the g pawn's missing, so your king is exposed. Number four, your queen's on h1. Okay, so because of all of this, I have compensation for a piece. I got lots of stuff going on. I'm not going to win my piece back right now, but I'm going to build and build, and my position is going to improve. Okay, bishop b2, bishop f5, just developing his bishop. He's like, I have enough compensation for a piece. This knight is pinned. I'm not worried about knight e4. You can't move your knight. Rook e1, controlling e4 in the e-file. f3, trapping the queen. Knight e4, queen h4. Again, black doesn't have a forced win, Black just has more than enough for a piece. And now you sort of realize why Petrosian played queen h1. 
He doesn't want to get mated on H2. He, he's pre-defending it. There's, there's no attack on H2. Also, getting mated on G2 would be bad. So you can see if White's queen was here, he would have a lot of other issues to deal with. So the queen is stopping black from mating him. Unfortunately, his queen's trapped on H1. That's not so good. Okay, H3, he's got to get his queen out. Bishop E5. Wow, nice bishops. Played rook E3, and this was an analysis given by chess base, which was takes, check, bishop takes C3. And now, if you take with a bishop, your knight's not defended sufficiently. If you take with a knight, this is really annoying. Okay, you guys are like, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so you can't take on G4, so he played rook E3. G takes H3, queen takes F3, bishop G4. Man, this looks like Tall has the black pieces, yeah? This is looking like a lot of attack. And again, I like to show Morphe games. I like to talk about Morphe a lot. Morphe used all of his pieces to attack. I think Gligerts is doing a good job. He's got everything over there. This guy's coming later. Give him, give him a chance. Queen H1, back to H1. Where'd you want him to go? Before, he, he did it because he wanted to. Now he has to. Or anywhere else to go, right? Okay. H2 check. King went to G2. It says the variation is King F1, Rook F3. That's very interesting. Because if you take it, and I take, I think this guy's going to promote. They, they don't agree. They're like, what? With check. Well, he agrees. Yeah. Okay. So he played king g2, queen h5. This seems like a nice square. So he's lining up here. And one thing I learned a long time ago, and it was actually, I learned it the hard way, but now I use it for my own benefit, is when you have a pawn of the seventh rank in the middle game, which is really rare, and then the guy can't take it for free, then I want the pawn on the seventh rank. I don't care what I have to do. I'll give you all my pieces. I don't care. And here I gave one piece. And then this guy's here? Wow. That's, I like pawns in the seventh rank. Yeah. Okay, knight d2 for obvious reasons, defending the f3 square. Bishop d4, also for obvious reasons. And he played queen e1. You can't move your rook, let's say like rook g3, because rook f2 is checkmate. The truth hurts. You've got to keep your rook here. You can't, you can't, let, him, can't let him take that guy. Okay, so queen e1, and finally, the Morphe method, rook a e8, getting them all involved. Oof. So the guy with white was considered the most solid world champion ever. And he's playing a guy who was not the world champion, but like Nezhmedinov, Gligorich could pound some guys. And Gligorich was top 10 in the world for a long time, played candidate smashes, inner zonals, first board for Yugoslavia. Nezhmedinov, who will lecture on at some other point, he was like, you know, okay. But I can't, I can't give you those kind of new accolades for him. I can't say he was board one, he played the Olympia, I, you know, he it is all, okay. But you don't have to be a boring player to play, to be a top player. Players are now, but back then you could play interesting chess. Okay, he played knight e4, and the variation is knight d1. Ugh, horrible. Knight e4, bishop takes b2, and now material is equal. Actually, I think Black's up a pawn. Derps again. But, but I want to give White his due. White has a big queenside initiative. Yeah, the more you laugh, the higher rated you are. Okay. Yeah, B4, A4, that didn't work out, did it? Then they just turned their attention to the kingside and ignored all that. Yeah, that's how you know things are going well. Okay, rook G3, pinning the bishop. Bishop E5, attacking the rook. He's got another rook, rook A3. King h8, getting off of this pin, which is a good idea. King h1. And that's actually one of my favorite things to do. When my opponent's checkmating me, and they have their pawn, I put my king in front of their pawn. So that was a white pawn on h2. In some positions, black would play queen h2 mate. Not, not here, you can't take your own pawn. So that's a very safe thing to do, is to put your king in front of a pawn in the seventh. Okay, in fact... Now his queen can start running around, although it can't, but it could in theory. It can't here. 
Okay, Rook G8, you guys are all confused. Why isn't he taking the Rook? Man, that's a, that's a good Bishop. If he ever trades the Bishop for the Rook, this diagonal gets open. Then when the guy plays Queen A1 check, you're like, oh. When the guy plays Knight F6, because your Bishop isn't on E5, you're like, oh. So that's that Bishop. Now that's a Bishop. And we had a lecture in this room on a Sunday about two weeks ago. I talked about exchange sacrifices. So... I think Petroja would be very happy to lose that exchange and get rid of that bishop on e5. Queen f1, bishop takes rook, he gets to get rid of it. And now that the rook is on g8, he has rook, rook takes knight. And this was a tactical mistake by Petrosian. Petrosian's queen was defending the d e4 knight, and he played queen f1. And now he saw in this position he could take it. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense if the white queen is on e1, you could just take back. Now the only way to take back is... How do you take back on e4? 94, 4 which obviously loses to? Bishop f3. Man, now... Mm -hmm. If only you knew how lost this was. Look at it for a second, you'll know. I have no doubt the engine will announce mate. No doubt. Man, the computer's like, no, it's only plus 57. It'll announce mate. It better announce mate. I'm getting mad. There's no forced mate if okay, mate, yeah, mate, I knew he'd announce mate. Yeah. Yeah, that's not that's not good. So after Rook takes e4, Petrosian. Exactly. And that was the most impressive game. Well, maybe the tall game was. I guess the tall game was because that was a candidates match. This was some tournament. Oh, well, this was in Arizona, I think. But beating Petrosian with black, it's hard to find those games unless black was Fisher. Then you can find some. Right? And in fact, a friend of mine who's older than all of you, he said, and, and higher rated than all of you, almost as high rated as me, almost, and 75 years old. And he said, when Fisher beat Larson 6 0, and when Fisher beat Timonov 6 0, that was very impressive. But when he beat Petrosian game after game, he said, that, now that was impressive. Because they knew he was going to beat Larson and Timonov. Petrosian was the world champion, and Petrosian was known for not losing, and Fisher beat him like four games in a row, so they were like, wow, you beat Petrosian every game. Nobody beats Petrosian, and that's why I showed you this game, because nobody beats Petrosian, and the problem is, when you have a big reputation like Petrosian, and you lose, everybody says, ooh, let's look at that game. So obviously, when Kasparov loses, and when Carlson loses, and when Karpov loses the world champion, that's the games we look at. They're like, wow, Kasparov lost to Ivanchuk. Let's see that game. When Kasparov wins eight games in a row in the 90s, you're like, yeah, of course he did. He's Kasparov. So when you're Petrosian, you lose with white, and you get the smackdown, getting checkmated, guys taking all your pieces, then we say, wow, let's look at that game, because that didn't happen very often. That's the kind of amazing player Gligorich was, and no matter how strong he played, my friend will be more impressed with his first name. My friend's like, Svenazar, that's the greatest name ever. So, and he died in 2012 at the age of 89. He was good at chess for over 50 years, and I had the chance to play. We played a very short game. It was a quick draw, and he was way past his prime. And if I have a prime, I was before my prime, if I even have one. And um, he was just a great player. And the Yugoslavia, when it existed, was a great country for chess, and he was the most famous player. And he was actually voted, it's in his Wikipedia article, like, Person of the Year in Yugoslavia, like Sportsman of the Year, Person of the Year, because they really like chess in Serbia and Croatia, and he was the best. So he was a very well-known, you know, famous person for his whole life, and he, I mean, he played great. He could win positionally by strangling you, as you saw in the first game. You could try to mate him, and he would defend. And so in the year, he just crushed Petrosian, all with the black pieces. The only lecture I ever gave about a player where he won all the games with black. Maybe he never won with white. And this is funny. I, I did a search of Petrosian games, and it just never ended. I mean, when I do a search for somebody, I find some games. Petrosian, for like 50 years, had games, and he played a lot. So it just kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I'm like, let's find the game he played Petrosian. Like, here's, 70, here's 70 of them. I'm like, what? So it was hard to find the games I wanted to find, because he played Tall, Fisher, Petrosian like a million times. And he never became the world champion, but he's very close. Clearly, like, number four or five in the world at his very peak. But hard to become the world champion. Even I haven't done it. Yet.
Class dismissed. <laughs>